finitude, otherness, and the eighth day. What an interesting topic. I hope you uh, don't mind my title choice because um, it's not easy setting up titles for uh, online videos. Uh, I'm always open to suggestions. But the elements of my title today, finitude, otherness, and the eighth day, are all going to be addressed in, in my talk. We've been talking about the church. We've been talking about its place, its value, and so on. What should happen when we enter into this place? What should take place when we uh, walk through the doors on a Sunday? Now, there is no wrong time to worship God. In our last section, we, session, we talked about that. But what should take place? What should be our main driving purpose? This is our fourth in a series of talks about uh, the church and who we are and so on and so forth. And we're looking at the thing that should happen most and foremost when we come together. I don't know if anybody here, I'm sure there are some Trekkies in my audience today. And um, this is the uh, Star Trek cast from the 1960s. You've got Scotty, Mr. Spock, Captain Kirk, Dr. McCoy, Uhura, and Chekhov. This is uh, part of their original. This is not the first season. I think it's the second season when Chekhov joined. Well, what's all that about? Well, Star Trek from the beginning to end has a kind of uh, an edict, a kind of a, a principle they drive by and they go by, and it's called the Prime Directive. The Prime Directive states loosely that no Federation um, crew or captain or whatever should ever... Uh, uh, get involved with uh, a um, and, and change the course of a species or, or or some other planet or whatever. The prime directive. You can look that up. It's not in the Bible, but whatever. Well, is there a prime directive for God's people? Something that should be the primary task when we come together. Now, last week we talked about the eighth day and the first day being the same day, really, and we talked about the fact that Christians in the New Testament met on the first day, which actually translates to being the eighth day. I had more fun doing this live in front of my congregation than on the video. Uh, the week before, we talked about the fact that public worship is preferred over private worship from an old Puritan sermon many years ago. So today we need to focus just a little bit more, and I want to get a one of many scriptures which you could say is a prime directive from God to his people. This is one of many, and there would be too many to list here, but, um, and you can find them. I'm sure you know many of these. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. I would suggest to you that this, this well-capsulated statement talks a lot, talks to us strongly about how we should behave in his presence, how we should relate to God. Now, you look at a statement like that, and you ask yourself if God is maybe behaving in a way that's uh, not maybe a bit like a narcissistic teenager. Why do you always need to be affirmed? Why do you always need to be worshipped? What's going on? Now, in that question, why do you always need to be is really the answer to the question. God has no need. God does not need to be worshipped or to be whatever in terms of depending on it. He does not depend on your worship. There's something completely different going on here. God's worship or the worship to God is... Mm. Well, let's go back to the words in our title and we'll make a bit of sense of this. And I think the little light should turn on for some of us. The first word we use is the word finitude, finitude. Then we use the word otherness. And later we're going to use the word created order, but we won't talk about it. It's not in the title. Finitude. Finitude is a quality, pers uh, is, is the quality of everything in the created order. Everything that's in the created order is finite. Have you got that? Everything that God created has a limit. It has certainly got one limit, and that is it began. Certainly had one limit, and that is that it is not eternally past. Everything in the created order that we know of is dependent on something else. Well, think about yourself. 
You are only a couple of heartbeats away from not living. Right? You're dependent on the right amount of food, the right amount of water. You're dependent on not too many cosmic rays. You're dependent on rocks not falling from the sky. You're dependent on, oh, you, you know what I'm talking about, dependent. You depend in every single way. Everything in the created order can only be in one place at one time. It's bound by time, bound by space. I can't be in two places at the same time or three or whatever. I wish I could. It's not possible to do that. So everything that is created is finite. It has finitude. It's dependent. Philosophers and Christian scholars and so on and others say that um, when a child understands their finitude, they begin to ask questions like, Mommy, where did I come from? What started me? Because they know they're finite. They know they weren't always. Somehow they've got consciousness developing. They've got logical thought. They've got to know where they came from and ultimately where they're going. Finitude, okay? Finitude is what keeps us where finitude determines or tells us. There's a word that describes where we are. We have no power over the future, no power over the past. Right here is where we live. Now we can make decisions. I could decide what I want to eat or I can decide that I need a sip of coffee. But truthfully, all I could do is decide an attempt. I might have dropped dead before I grabbed it or the coffee may not have been in the cup. We're just totally bound. God, on the other hand, is other. A good word to describe God in terms of ourselves is otherness. God is not on a scale with us in any way. It's not like one guy this morning, um, I was passed by three runners, two runners. Uh, that's rare. Usually I scorch somebody, but it didn't happen today. I was fast. The second runner, a lady, was faster. And the third runner, a man, a third runner, a man was fastest. Well, it does not mean that you can put God on a scale and say that he is the uber fastest that puts him on a scale. God is not on a scale in any way with the created order. He's not finite. It's not like uh, God says, what's that guy's name? No, no. Or uh, how many hairs does he have in his head? No. Or how am I ever going to be there and here at the same time? How can I do that? No, no, no. God is not bound in any way by the created order. Otherness is an excellent word, one of my favorite words to describe God. Now, we've talked about some of these divine qualities of God, his omnipotence, omniscience, and so on. And one is not greater than the other. I like the, the word otherness. It gets to me really, really well. And it helps me to, to sort of um, encapsulate the sense that God is ineffable, undescribable, and different in every way from the created order. Now, this should help us to understand the sense of worship and what it's, and what, what it's all about. Worship is only due to the infinite. Nothing in the created order is to be worshipped. So worship is not something God needs, but it's an automatic response to the finite meeting the infinite. Those with finitude in the presence of one who has no limits. Those of us who are totally dependent in every way, who know that we're blessed by one who depends on nothing. Think about depending on nothing, not dependent on time, not dependent on space, not dependent on temperature, depends on nothing, not moved by anything in the created order. So when God's people come together to worship him and to praise him and to bless him, this is that sense that we need to have. And this is that, this is that prime directive working itself out. Let me take you to a passage from the book of Romans that might help you. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So this is talking about those who did not please God. What did they do? They worshipped the creature rather than the creator. They were, um, they, they, their image, their view was taken away from the infinite and put on the finite. So what should happen in us on a Sunday morning or when we get together to worship? What should the minister's goal be and the people's goal be? To move our view from the finite to the infinite. To move our view away from the things we depend on and our dependencies to the one who cares for us day by day. What's the natural action? Awe and worship. There are other elements of this that are important, that are interesting. This requires that we as a people are very honest with God when we come to him. It requires a kind of soul-searching honesty. There's a very interesting story about something that brings that brought glory to God or would bring glory to God that's kind of in an odd place. 
A man named Achan committed a terrible, wicked thing, sin, in the, around the time of the fall of Jericho. The story of Joshua records this. And Joshua confronts him with his sin, and he tells Achan how to give glory to God. I'm going to pop this screen, this um, image up on the screen, or this verse up on the screen. A couple of verses. And he brought near his household, man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. So have a look at what Joshua says to Achan in the middle of verse 19. My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him and tell me what you have done. It's surprising what things bring glory to God. It's very interesting. When we come together, we need a genuine, heartfelt honesty in the presence of God. Some churches have a kind of ritual, uh, not, it's not a ritual, it's not really, you know, where, where we, uh, that's a bad word, but a part of their worship service is the public confession of sin. It's a publicly laying bare and saying, Lord, we have failed you this week. There's a lot to be said for that. There's a lot to be said for that whole attitude. Certainly when we prepare our hearts to worship, when we come to worship, we need to be honest. Now, do you know what that does? That brings glory to God. When you fail him and you confess your sins, you glorify him, you bring him worship. And so our, as, as people come together, that's a thing to consider. It's something that, hey, have you ever thought about that? Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul, many years later, wrote a uh, letter to his um, son in the faith named Timothy. Timothy was obviously much younger than Paul, and he was caring for a group of people, and it was not an easy journey for the young man. Paul gives him some advice that, um, that goes a long way in telling us how things should happen or what things should happen when we come together publicly. And it's, it's right, it's worth reading. I'll read it to you. Well, we'll pop it up on the screen. This is Paul's advice to young Timothy. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Can you see public worship going on here? The public reading of scriptures, exhortation and teaching and hearers. You see all of these elements taking place. We have just from this one verse and uh, a, a picture of the things that should take place when we're publicly in the presence of God. The reading of scripture, exhortation, that is encouragement, teaching, being examples to one another, and, um, and being examples before God. Very interesting. This uh, one kind of passage crystallizes that whole sense of public worship. This whole idea that we need to constantly point to the infinite away from the finite, always to the other not to ourselves. Now, I'm going to pop on the screen a slide from an earlier talk that is in this series. So our first was, this is from our first in the series of the church. The second one was public worship is preferred over private. Then we did the eighth day last week, the eighth and the first day. And again, there's no wrong time to worship God. The point of the eighth day was the new creation was being, um, uh, was celebrated, being remembered. We talked about church structures and how they work. I want to just check something here, have a look at my time. I'm not doing too badly. And we talked about this, the question of what the role of the minister or the leader is, where he should fit in the congregation, what the relationship between the people and God should be, and so on. And we used this example here or this image we saw God on the top, obviously. We saw God on the top, and we saw the people having no uh, barrier between themselves and God. And then we saw supporting this action, elders, if needed, that is mature people in the, in the church, if you had the numbers and you needed this to happen. And on the very bottom, the pastor or the minister 
who might um, who would support the elders in their spiritual journey and so on. Now, some churches might have this a little bit reversed, but nevertheless, the ministry sits in importance under helping the people of God to um, uh, to worship God. Now, it does not mean that as a minister, I'm in the back of the church pushing everybody to praise God. No, I'm, I'm in this odd sort of place of being in front of the church along with those who help us lead worship and so on, because I don't sing very well. As you know, uh, I'm in the purp- my purpose is to be in the front of the church, yet to direct people to worship God and how to worship God and to help people to move and, 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 and set aside the cares of this life and set aside the things of the finite and the things of the dependent and look to the one who is uh, who depends on nothing, who is infinite. That very much is the job of the minister. Now, you'll also get a sense from looking at Paul's commands to Timothy that the minister has a very important role in being an example and leading the people and so on. I'm not sure you're aware of this, but people who are ministers get judged twice as hard as others. Be not many masters, you shall receive the greater condemnation, it says in the old King James, but in the book of James. Um, Ministers get judged much harder. So however that's going to work on the day when I pass, I'm going to stand before God and I will be scrutinized much more thoroughly than people who have not stood in front of the people of God. And what questions will God ask me? What grounds for what will be the grounds for his legitimate scrutiny of me as a minister and you as a minister, if you're a minister, did you bring glory to me? It's not because God is a narcissistic dependent teenager. No, bringing glory to him takes the people's sense of their dependency and their fear away and helps them to relate to the one who depends on nothing, on God who de- who is the giver of all life and so on. And there's a lot of passages about this. And again, this is not about the people or whatever. We come to church on a Sunday morning not to say, not to ask first, what does it get me? What does it, what do I get out of it? What is the benefit to me? We come first of all to say, are we adequately worshiping and giving glory to God? Are we adequately doing that? Am I in a place where God is glorified first? Say, well, I don't benefit from that. Oh, well, first of all, you do benefit from it. But, but secondly, this is the absolute and the only real question. Our sense is not to be here to, uh, to impress anyone but the audience. And who's the audience? God. But also to be an example to the others who are around us and help them make that journey. Ladies and gentlemen, I love the church, not just the local church, not just the national church, not just the eternal church, all of the church. I love the work of God. I think this this organism, this body, this this above time group of believers is the greatest thing in all creation. It's the greatest thing in the created order. Imagine that you are shoulder to shoulder with all of the greats who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ in times past. Today, even those, and, and, and by the way, greats doesn't mean great well-known. It's anyone who's trusted in God. Shoulder to shoulder. You're shoulder to shoulder in the presence of God with people who have yet to be born. Now, in the traditional church, you, 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 this is kind of model. You, you get this idea of the church pew and the structure of the church and its order. The whole picture is we are shoulder to shoulder. We're, we're together. We're all equal before God who is great above all. This is this wonderful sense that we who are dependent are being offered a relationship with one who depends on nothing, who is totally other totally other. I love the church. I think it's just the greatest topic of all. Our topic today has been finitude, otherness, and the eighth day. The eighth day, the first day when we come together. And again, there's no wrong time to worship God. Finitude, otherness. We are finite. God is other. God bless you. Let's talk again later. Hey, like, share, and subscribe if these videos mean anything to you. Send them to your friends. Send them to your enemies. My name is Al Persson. We can contact, be in touch. My name is Al Persson. Contact me at that email address if you want or in the comments below. God bless. We'll talk later.